Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being with us. And we trust that everyone had a had a delightful Thanksgiving, some good food, and some time with with family, perhaps virtually, but some time with family, and some time to allow ourselves, as we discussed last week, to allow ourselves to spontaneously feel the joy and the gratitude of living, of life, of this magnificence, this miracle that we are in every day, that we are every day. Today we're going to take um, some ideas from, from many different places, but I want to give credit to Joel Goldsmith in his book, uh, Consciousness Unfolding. Let me see, I have a very old copy of it here. Someone donated to the center from... Uh, from the library when their mom passed away. It was their mother's books and they brought them in and gave them all to Lori. But Goldsmith is a modern mystic. And, and when I say modern, I think he passed away in the mid 60s. And many of his teachings uh, are, are available as audio tapes and they are on uh, YouTube. Somebody has, has very, very kindly uploaded many of them to YouTube. So you can actually go to YouTube and. I imagine if you Google Joel Goldsmith Consciousness Unfolding, you will actually be able to hear one of his talks on this very same subject from his book. Now, when I say Goldsmith was a mystic, we're going to talk more about mysticism as we get into, into uh, the Christmas season. And Dr. Holmes tells us that a mystic is not a mysterious person, but just one who senses the presence of God. Right? A conscious realization of the presence of God. Just keep, keep that in mind, a conscious realization of the presence of God. This is kind of the mystical experience that we talk of. Richard Maurice Buck, in his book, Cosmic Consciousness, he, he called it cosmic consciousness. Um, this experience of the presence of the divine, the presence and the activity of the divine, the experience of it in us and as us and through us and in and as and through all persons and in and as and through all things, this is an experience of unity, of oneness. This is an experience where ideas of separation, of, of exclusion, of differences, all of those things are gone. All of those things are gone. And it is not an intellectual uh, exercise in that it cannot, be, <clears throat> it cannot even be grasped by the intellect. It is the ineffable. In some of the prayers from the East, they start out, O oh, ineffable one, O oh, ineffable one. And I invite you to consider that phrase this week, O oh, ineffable one. See, we use, we use words, and you know, if you've listened to me for a while, that I'm kind of a, a stickler for words. I, I love to kind of ask, well, what do we really mean by that? Because we tend to use words and we just assume that everybody has the same meaning as, as we do. And very often it's not, it's not the same. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, what, what do I mean by that? So we talk about God. You, know, you say, well, what do you mean by that? What, what, what is your idea of God? And every January we go back to that. Janu the first Sunday in January every year. What is your concept of God? What do you mean by that? Now we have to consider that whatever whatever word we use to describe the divine, it doesn't make any difference to the divine. But it makes every bit of difference to us because it is our concept of God, of the divine, and what it is and what we are in relation to it. <coughs> See, that determines the entire course of our lives. This experience is not one that can be grasped with the intellect, but the intellect can tell us that that experience is there. But in that experience, the intellect is not. 
and therefore we say ineffable one because we can't describe it. It reminds me of the candy bars, indescribably delicious, you know. It can't be described, oh ineffable one, oh ineffable one. So Goldsmith was such a person, that's why we would call him a mystic, he was such a person who experienced the presence of the divine. And Goldsmith encouraged each and every one of us to have that same experience. Now this is, this is very interesting to me. If you look at the religions of the world, the world religions, if you look at them, they were all started when somebody had the experience. Moses experienced the burning bush, the bush, the fire that burns and does not consume, which was a metaphor for a deep meditative experience. And in that experience, he experienced the I am. See, anytime we put a label or a name on God, we are limiting it. And yet that which is the divine is not, has no limits. You and I take, take a piece of wood, for example. We go to the lumber yard, we, we, we buy some lumber, and we make it into a chair. And as soon as we have made it into the chair, it is not. It is not a door. It is not a table. Mm -hmm. It is not a countertop, not a boat, not a sun deck. It is a chair. So in our human experience, we think of things as this and not that, this and not that. We limit, we define. And again, from the East, we are told neti neti. Neti neti, not this, not that. When, when we try to name the divine, it is not this, it is not that. It is not what we can name because our name for it is inadequate. It is ineffable. So Dr. Holmes tells us that a mystic is not a mysterious person, not like the mad monk Rasputin that you see in the movies, the old black and white movies from the 30s and the 40s. But a mystic is someone who senses, who feels, not, not intellectually, but through experience, through realization, th through, through this inner knowing that we call it, the, no the gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, Gnostics, Gnosis. It is. It is. So Moses experienced the I amness. I am. So every religion is founded or started, I won't say the religion is founded, I'll say religion starts when someone has the experience and sometimes it's founded later by others. And remember a couple of weeks ago I talked about the Shakers and the lady who is, who is attributed to be the founder of the Shakers was Mother Anne. And she was studying with a, a, a Quaker study group in, in the Manchester area of England, Bolton, some of my folks are from there. And they were, they were called the Shaking Quakers because they moved. They moved in ecstatic dance. When they felt the presence, they moved, you see. And Mother Anne was one of their students, and she went on to be, to be considered the founder of the Shakers when she had such an experience, an experience of the presence of the divine. So every religion seems to start with that, someone having that experience. But then they tend to drift away from encouraging the adherence that you too, you too can have this experience. But not Goldsmith, not Joel Goldsmith. He made it very clear that this is his teaching he called the infinite way. And he said the purpose of, of the infinite way was to experience consciousness, the divine consciousness unfolding as us, as you, as me. So who are you? Why are you here and where are you going? Now we are told by the philosophers, well, these are the three great, <clears throat> great questions in life. But I have to push back and say, <clears throat> well, what makes them great? You know, is, is it great because we put a label on them and we say they're great, or are they great because we spend a great deal of time 
contemplating them. And I just invite you to, to look back on your last week since we were together last Sunday. And did you spend any time at all contemplating those three questions? And I hope, I hope your answer is, that, well, at least some, and perhaps a great deal. But if we look at, at the population as a whole, and you ask yourself, you know, of all of the hundreds of millions of people in this country and all of the billions of people in the world, how much time do you really think, <laughs> of all the time that was available to all the people, how much time was really spent in deep contemplation? Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Now, it's interesting to me that we as human beings are so, sort of very curious, or we can be very curious. And I think it is this, this very curiosity, the, it, the one thing that, that the divine put in us when it created us, to ensure that we would, we would discover the miracle. So, so to ensure that it would have the joy of discovering itself through us and as us, it is this desire to seek, this desire to know, this curiosity. And we are not curious all of the time. You know, there are times where we, we're just simply not curious at all. You know, somebody tells us something, we go, okay, well, that's the way it is. I love the movie uh, Forrest Gump, and, and for me, what worked for me in the movie was Forrest Gump was, was so successful in this world because he simply did as he was told. He didn't ask questions. You know, we, you know, Mama said this, Mama said that, or Lieutenant Dan said this, Lieutenant Dan said that. Somebody told him to do something, he just did it. And his life was so simple, and he became enormously wealthy. And, and to me, that's the satire that the author, I, I don't know if they intended it that way, I hope they did, but that's what I got out of it, you know. Just do as you're told, don't ask questions, life will be wonderful. But there's that within us that wants to know, you know. Think of a small child asking why, why, why. How many hundreds and hundreds of questions a little one will ask in a day, you know. Why? Why? There's something within them that is curious. There's something within them that wants to know. And I think the greatest curiosity that we have, in terms of perhaps most important, using great in that, in that way, are these three questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? So we have, we have, you know, kind of the human experience. You know, people, we identify, let's put it this way. We, we, each and every one of us, we self-identify with, with something or things. We, we think, well, this is who I am, or this is what I am, or these are, these are my people, or these are my customs, or these are the way that we do things, you know. Thanksgiving, we talk about the different customs of the different families and the different cultures. But as we are born into this world, the Buddhists tell us that we, when we got here, the game was already in progress. We didn't make the rules. We didn't have a rule book, you know. We used to have a little, a little book at the center in Wilmington, and it was called Your Owner's Manual. And it looked just like the owner's manual for a car. And Lori spoke to the gentleman who wrote it. He was a delightful, delightful older gentleman. And he just wrote this little book. And the premise was, you know, if you buy a new car, when you open the glove box, there's this book in there that tells you everything you need to know how to successfully operate that car. But we come into this world and, and we don't have that, you see. And we're, try, we're constantly trying to figure, how, how does this thing called life work? Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? So we, we are curious. That which we are seeking has caused us to seek. And eventually we discover we are that which we are seeking. 
that that which is causing us to seek is that which we are seeking. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? I, th I think it was, uh, it was either Augustine or, or Thomas Aquinas. I get their, their two writings kind of mixed up. But one of the two said we would not have the desire to pray if God had not first placed it in our hearts. Something causes us to seek. We are natural born seekers. Now you know the little children ask why, ask why, ask why, to, to the point of sometimes they drive the adults around them crazy, you know. Because I said so, you know. But they want to know. You see, they want to know. But over time, what happens is, is that incessant seeking, it, that, that curiosity, it can be distracted or it can be, it can be stifled. You know, stop asking so many questions. Sometimes we get into, into an environment, in a school environment, and we find out that it's not so much about what we want to know as what we need to remember in order to pass tests. So the curiosity kind of gets replaced with memorizing things. You know. A few years ago, I, I took some courses over at the local technical college. Uh, I was trying to get into the video production program there. And I had to take the prerequisites and, you know, just basic things like math and English and st stuff like that. And every classroom had a sign uh, up talking about how the mission of the, of the organization was to develop critical thinkers. And yet every single class I attended had absolutely no time for, for entertaining just questions. The teacher presented, the information was there, you went and did your homework, you came back and they graded your homework and, and yes, you could ask a question and say, well, I got, this, I got this answer wrong, where did I go wrong? That kind of question you could ask. But no, no deeper, deeper questions, no philosophical questions, no, why is this important? None of those things. In, in other classes, the, you couldn't even ask, well, how do I know that this is true? How do I know that what I'm being told is true? It's just simply the textbook said this, and it's going to be on the test, and you just remember this, and this will be on the test. So I'm bringing that up because <clears throat> in, in some of our institutions, then, what happens is this curiosity that we had as children goes away, gets stifled, gets pushed down. And what we want to do as adults is, is if ours has, has been diminished in any way, we want to reawaken that. We want to reawaken that childlike curiosity. The Bible says, come to me as little children. Come to me as little children, you know. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? So... As I mentioned, it is an experience of the presence of the divine. A, Dr. Holmes called it a conscious realization of the experience of the presence of the divine. Now, Dr. Holmes, in his teachings, he had mystical experiences himself. There's, there's one that um, um, I think it's Bill Hornaday, who was his associate, uh, wrote about in one of his works called the Holmes Papers. He kind of did a, a biography of Ernest. And uh, Dr. Holmes was at a church, I believe it was Glendale, California, and they were dedicating this new building. And he went there and he was speaking to the crowd. And <clears throat> he was just speaking to the crowd and suddenly he said, oh no, oh no, the veil is very thin. And he sat down and, it, you know, people will were worried about him, you know, did something happen? Was he having some sort of a medical emergency? What, was, what in the world was going on? And what he, what he said was he just suddenly saw the human forms sitting in front of him disappear and kind of morph into little lights. And, and he experienced everybody in the audience as a presence of light. 
and he was he was kind of having that experience, the experience of unity, the experience of oneness that that we hear about. And it overwhelmed him, and he and he sat down. Our Monday night group is is reading through uh, Don Miguel Ruiz's The Four Agreements, and. Uh, Don Miguel came to the Asilomar Conference Center one year and spoke spoke to the crowd, and I was in the crowd at the time. And one of one of our um, ministers, uh, James Golden, who is a past president of Religious Science International, uh, he was telling us one time he had gone on a retreat somewhere with with Don Miguel Ruiz, and whatever was going on, Don Miguel called him up on the stage, and a, and a similar thing happened to James. He got up on the stage. And he, he could just sense the presence of all the persons in the room. And he became overwhelmed. And he said he became overwhelmed with sadness because he realized how much people were suffering and how needless that suffering was. And Don Miguel put his arm around him and said, don't take it so seriously. Everybody is only dreaming. And this reminds me again of something that Goldsmith said. He said, if you go back to the book of Genesis, you know, there are two creation stories in Genesis. I'll leave you to figure those two out for yourself. They're within the first four chapters, so you don't have to look far. But God put Adam into a deep sleep. Remember, he put Adam into a deep sleep, and the myth, myth is then, and he took the rib and he created Eve out of that rib. But nowhere in the Bible does it tell us that Adam ever woke up. And what Joel Goldsmith tells us is, is that we are all still asleep in that Adam dream, the dream of the world, the dream of the way that things work on the material level. And we must awaken from that to the spiritual level. Thomas Troar talks about evolution. And he says, you know, if we, if we look at, at the stages of evolution, that life evolved from, from the mineral to the vegetable, to the animal, to the human. But now we are entering what he called the fifth kingdom. And the fifth kingdom is the spiritual kingdom. But we can only enter that with conscious cooperation. Conscious cooperation. Some of the, uh, the Hindu writers, the Hindu mystics, say that change occurs either over a very, very, very long time through evolution or through an individual revolution, an individual revolution. This is what Troward is saying. We have to participate consciously and willingly. We have to do the one thing that only we can do, and no one can do it for us. We have to, we have to rekindle our childlike curiosity. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? We have to kindle that and we have to pursue that. Again, from the East, it says, don't go, after, go looking for God unless you're, you're seeking as earnestly as you would seek a pond if your hair was on fire. How much effort do we put into it? How much time do we put into our practice, you see? How important is that to us? <clears throat> And the world is much different than it was thousands of years ago. You know, one of the things when, when I watched that show on the Shakers, one of the things that, that I took away from it is <clears throat> that in, in an agricultural society and in a society where they could use their labor to make products, you know, good products that people would buy, they, they could exist. But when the Industrial Revolution came along, and they mentioned this a little bit in the show, when the Industrial Revolution came along and, and people could buy the same products that the Shakers were making, but they could get them much cheaper from someplace else, 
the source of income for the for the Shakers kind of went away. Right? You think, so you think of you think of people trying to live in today's society on a 200 acre farm and how many how much they have to pay in taxes and where are they going to get the money to pay those and things like that and and the system itself kind of pushes out that way of life where somebody can just go sit on a piece of land somewhere and and have the entire day to contemplate what is your identity who do you identify with what do you identify with if we ask some if i asked you who are you would you give me your name and is that who you are or is that is that a name that your parents gave you some, sometimes we ask people who they are and they would tell us what their job is, you know, oh, I'm the manager of this, or I'm the manager of that, or I'm the president of this, or president of that, you know. Tell us what they do, but not who they are. Who are you? On the, on the Monday Night Group a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned in, in Buddhism they have the cones, which are, which are like unsolvable riddles that kind of preoccupy the intellect so that something else can unfold. And one of them is, what did your face look like before you were born? What did your face look like before you were born? Now what, what these tend to do, we're, we're, we're going with this, is if I ask you who are you and what are you, the materialist, there's two major viewpoints in the world, the materialist and, and I'll call them the transcendentalists, which is what Emerson was, right? And, and transcendentalism, if you, if, you, if you read into it, it just basically said we are more than matter. We are, we, we are spirit that transcends matter. That's it. That's it. No, nothing, nothing magical about that. But the materialist view of the world is, is that life has evolved from matter. That there is this energy that becomes matter, and then the matter takes form and somehow it gets animated along the way. And it becomes life. And everything that we know as life is nothing more than chemical reactions of the matter. And when, when the form is no longer capable of supporting life, well, just the matter decays. It goes back to energy. It's recycled again. The transcendental view or the mystical view or the, or the spiritual view is that spirit existed before matter. Spirit created matter out of itself. Matter is an expression of spirit as, as ice and steam, for example. So we have water as steam, as liquid, as ice, but it's all water, you see. And we have the idea, the idea of spirit is, is a consciousness that is not dependent upon form not dependent upon matter. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist in matter. It doesn't mean that it doesn't require matter. It just means that it is not dependent upon matter. So the materialist view is that consciousness, this thing we call consciousness, the activity of mind, the activity of thought, the movement of mind, is nothing more than a result <coughs> of a physical cause. And the spiritual view is that consciousness preceded, preceded the formation of matter. So in the idea of evolution, we can kind of think of, well, we have, we have these single-celled animals, and over time they get together and they make multi-celled animals, and then over time some of those cells become specialized into different organs, and, you know, th that way, and then eventually they grow fins and flippers and <clears throat> swim about. Excuse me, I'm getting some water. So at each stage, the matter is becoming something more than it was at the previous step. But the spiritual view is, is that the totality, the totality of what spirit is, was involved in matter from the beginning. Didn't evolve from matter, it was involved in matter from the very beginning. And then what is happening is, is this spirit, which is consciousness, consciousness is awareness, that this consciousness is now unfolding. 
So it's not becoming more. It's not becoming something that it was never before. But it is expressing more of what it is at every step of the way. We use the example of the acorn and the oak tree. And then the oak tree and the forest. When we hold an acorn in our hand, it is an oak tree. But it is an oak tree expressing itself in the form of an acorn. But when it becomes a giant oak, it is still what it was as the acorn. It is just, it is just unfolded. It is just unfolded into a tree. And then that tree puts out more acorns, and then those acorns become a forest, you see. So we hold an acorn in our hand, and we're holding an entire oak forest in our hand because they are, in essence, the same. It's just that the acorn has not unfolded yet. But everything that's going to be in that forest is in that acorn, you see? All the trees. It is unfolding. So physical evolution, in the, in the Eastern view, then consciousness or spirit descended into matter, cloaked itself in matter, so that it could have the joy of unfolding in new and different ways. The unity became multiplicity. But it knows itself as total unity. And then each and every one of us is an individualized expression of that consciousness. But as that infinite intelligence descended into matter, cloaked itself in matter, it took on the appearance of ignorance. It can only express itself when it, once it decides to come into, into the form of matter. It can only express itself as the form allows at the time. So the intelligence is more obvious, for example, in, uh, in an elephant than it is in an earthworm. But it is the same life. There are not different, not different life, different forms, but not a different life. And then this process of physical evolution brings us to a being such as ourselves, which is capable of self-awareness. Right? So, so we know in the animals, they, <clears throat> the scientists will say, well, they, they have simple awareness or simple consciousness. They're aware of their environment. They can find food. They can find water. They can do all of these things. But in human beings, we can become aware of our own consciousness. We are consciousness becoming aware of itself. And what is the divine except pure consciousness? Now we may not realize it, but what we are doing is we are becoming aware of the divine in ourselves, as ourselves, through ourselves. So what Joel Goldsmith starts his, his book out telling us is, is that the purpose, who am I, why am I here, where am I going? So who am I is I am an individualized expression of divine consciousness. I am not my name. I am not my job. I am not my body. I am an individualized expression of consciousness. Do you remember when you were a child? Do you remember your first day of school? Or do you remember your first bike? Or do you remember a birthday party from a long time ago? Or some significant event from when you were a little child? Can you recall it in great detail? Do you remember what clothes you were wearing? Do you remember what food you were eating, if it was a birthday party, you remember what flavor cake you had, you know, what songs you sang, did you play pin the tail on the donkey, all of these different things. These are memories that we have that we can access. 
and yet the body of that little child no longer exists. It is long gone. It has turned into dust. So the scientists tell us that every, like every two years, every cell, including the bones in our body, is completely changed out. As, as we are sitting here together today, our body is, is generating billions of new cells and releasing, releasing and letting go of billions of old cells. So we are not our bodies. And why am I here? Who am I? An individualized expression of divine consciousness. And why am I here? To realize that. To realize the consciousness of the divine unfolding as us. That's what life is about. And it's not, it's not about making a lot of money or dying with the most toys and, and all those other things. It is about realizing what we are. It is about realizing the presence of God within. And where we are going is only into a deeper realization of that <clears throat> for eternity, for as long as we live. So we consider that and say, well, how do we do that? You see, oh, that sounds good on paper, but how do we do that? And it is, as, a, <clears throat> as we say, it's practice. It's practice. We have to let go of our opinions that we are only human. We have to start identifying with the spiritual nature of ourselves. We have to have that personal revolution that the Hindu mystics talk about. We have to, we have to devote ourselves totally to finding the presence of the divine within us because that's the only place we're going to find it, to finding the presence of the divine within us, as <laughs> seeking it as we would seek a pond if our hair was on fire. Now, as I mentioned for previous weeks, the tool that we have to do that is our consciousness, is our awareness we may become aware of what we are aware of. We may even become aware of what is going on below our level of consciousness in the subliminal mind, you know, in, in the emotional life. We can observe that based on what we do, how it drives our behaviors. But basically what we are trying to do is to learn more every day about our true nature, not the nature that's been imposed upon us by society. Not the nature that has been imposed upon us by the world. But the true nature that was given to us before we were born. Before we entered this lifetime here on this planet. The divine must be pure consciousness. Before thoughts, but from which thoughts come. Before words, but from which words come. Not encumbered by any, any form that it takes on, but it transcends any form that it takes on. We have to bring ourselves to that awareness, and we have to invite ourselves to have that realization. We can catch ourselves when we, are, when we are falling into the ideas of limitation. And we can remind ourselves that God is all there is. The divine is all there is. Love. Love, the experience of unity, is all there is. Goldsmith gives us an interesting example in, in the first chapter of this book. He says, if, if, you, if you find a toddler, you know, crawling around on the floor playing with its toys, you know, I get a picture of little ones. Remember, the, we 
they had the building blocks, and they would stack these building blocks up. Little trucks, little little wheeled vehicles, they would roll back and forth. If an adult came to that child and gave it a $20 gold piece, the child would have no understanding of what it is. It would have no value whatsoever to the child. Because the child has not yet learned to identify money <clears throat> as supply. Love. <laughs> See, love is what is that little child's avenue to supply the love of its parents, the love of its grandparents, love. And he just gave us that example that said, if we, if we look at our lives, and this is when, when we're doing uh, treatment work with people, we say, you know, what is your, what is your secondary causation here? Let me explain what we mean by that. We always want to work with pr first cause, primary cause, which is consciousness. We never want to work in effect. So somebody comes and says, I want to take a trip to California um, this year. I want to go to the conference at Asilomar. Okay, so you want to do that. Well, how is that going to help you grow spiritually? Oh, well, yes, you know, it's going to help me. I'm going to hear all these great talks and all these things. Wonderful. So what can we do for you? I said, well, I figured it out that it's going to cost X amount of money to go. And in order for me to make X amount of money extra, I need Y hours of overtime. So I want to do, do treatment work for Y hours of overtime. That's working in secondary causation. What you want is to go to California. What you want is to go to have that experience. So that's what we need to focus on. And then let the ways and means figure themselves out by, by ways that we, we know not of, you see. So we can catch ourselves whenever we're saying, well, this needs to happen, and this needs to happen, and this needs to happen, and we can stop ourselves and say no. How would God look at that, see? Would God say, gee, I need, I need, how would that look at the situation? And if we can start to see life as the divine must see it, or as we imagine the divine must see it, we can start to break ourselves out of secondary causation and get back to first cause. God is all there is. God is perfect love. God is perfect peace. God is perfect supply. Whatever it wants to create, it creates out of itself by becoming the thing created. The energy becomes the matter. The matter takes form. The form gives expression to the idea, to the consciousness behind it. And when it is time to let go of that expression, it releases its form, it releases its energy, and that form and that energy get recycled into something else. We want to start to identify with this divine action. We want to start to identify with consciousness, being, being the creator. We want to associate with it mentally, but more importantly, more importantly, we must declare every day that we are open and we are receptive to the conscious realization of the experience of the presence of God. Today, today, I experience God, God's consciousness unfolding through me, unfolding as me. Last example for today, and we'll close. You've heard me use this in the past. But if it's a bright sunny day and I have a dark curtain pulled around my sunroom here, the sunlight can't get through. But if I take a little pin and I go over to that curtain and I poke holes in it, <clears throat> one by one, a little stream of light will come through and it will shine on the floor. And if I look at it from here, 
I might see a hundred different dots of light, and I might think that they are all separate, and they are all different, and, and they're, they're not like each other. But the fact is, on the other side of that curtain, there's only one. There's only one sun. And all of those little dots of light are individualized expressions of that one sun. And in their nature, if I analyze that light with a spectrometer, it is the same light as on the other side of that curtain. We have created this curtain in our consciousness out of ignorance. It has been, <laughs> been handed down to us by, by generations of parents and teachers and clergy. And what we must be willing to do is to say everything that I have ever believed, everything that I have ever learned is possibly wrong and probably wrong. And I want to do the one thing that only I can do, which is to observe the consciousness of the divine unfolding in my life. I want to experience it in the ineffable matter of the mystics. I want to feel it. I want to live it. Nearer than, <clears throat> nearer than my hands and feet, closer than my breath. The love of God is within. Take your time. Do your practice. Sit in silence. And sit for no other purpose. Not to pray for anything, not to treat for anything, not to, <clears throat> not to think about anything, not to listen to anything. But simply to be in the presence of the divine. It's my only intention. My only intention. Experience the presence of the divine. That is why we are here. That is what we are to the degree that we realize it. And that is what we are going to be realizing more fully forever and ever and ever. And so it is.